have any other way? Have you still got any of that Puerto Rican eggnog in the fridge? Oh, yeah, uh, Coquito, yeah. All right, all right, all right. Wonderful people. Welcome. Good evening. It's a beautiful Sunday evening here in Austria. I hope you're all well. I'm delighted to welcome you to another Light em Up live session. Tonight we have David Blanco from Blanco Cigars joining us as our special guest. And I'm really looking forward to this beautiful session. As always, welcome to all of you joining us here at the lounge via Zoom. Welcome to all the people over there on Facebook. I'll be keeping track of all your questions that you put into the comments underneath the video. Um, so if you have any questions, please put them underneath uh, the live stream over on Facebook. Here at the lounge, if you have a question, just use the raise your hand button or let me know in the chat box if you have a question. And I'm very much looking forward to bringing all your questions in. So without further ado, once again, welcome, happy evening, happy Sunday, and welcome, David Blanco. It's a pleasure and honor to have you. Welcome and light him up. Thank you very much for having me, Reinhardt. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm so happy to see so many familiar faces and some new ones. So that's great. Thank you. You know, we've been running the, the light em up session ever ever since this whole um, COVID-19 situation sort of got really messy. And I'm, I'm just grateful and honored to have so many wonderful people joining us from all over the world and that we get to connect and share a great cigar, share a great drink and listen to some fabulous stories. I mean, it's the cigar family and, and the cigar industry is really all about the people. It's about these unique stories, your individual takes, and the mesmerizing products that we all get to share. So, David, give us, um, for, for the, the few people who do not know um, exactly where you're coming from, um, um, do not know all the intricate details about um, Blanco Cigar Company, give us a, a brief introduction to yourself and the company. Sure. Um, my uh, family's been in this industry uh, since the 1800s, actually, 1886. Uh, is the year that we uh, we see as our first year in the industry. I am the fifth generation uh, in the business. However, the first American born. Our family originally came from Spain and then went to Cuba. Uh, they came from uh, Asturias, which is the northern a northern province north of the Pyrenees, uh, from Leon and Quijón. Uh, they came across the Atlantic, uh, came to Cuba, and uh, there they started many businesses. One of them, including a tobacco company um, for grown primarily growing tobacco, not manufacturing cigars uh, back then. But uh, over the years, it evolved in Cuba. And of course, as uh, is a common story among all Cuban families, unfortunately, um, they lost everything um, and had to leave. Uh, my immediate family came here to the United States and I was the first one born here in the United States. Um, and some of my cousins didn't get out um, to this day, they're still there, but the others that did get out that were in the industry got out shortly after my immediate family did and they had no need to come to the United States because they wanted to continue growing tobacco for premium cigars so they went to Central America Nicaragua and, and, and then eventually Honduras um, so this is how the family spread after the implosion uh, if you will in in uh, in Cuba during the, the revolution in 1959 and um, the family was scattered uh, so at that point it wasn't until uh, I was of a young man's age and the entire um, industry started changing to a younger crowd, which was the advent of cigar aficionado uh, in the early 90s. That uh, younger generation, uh, people my age were smoking cigars. Before that, growing up, I was always around cigars in, in the home being a Cuban family, but it was the old men playing dominoes, drinking coffee <laughs> and smoking cigars. It was something the old men did. It was nothing that the younger guys did. Um, it was always around. I was always aware of it, but never saw this as an opportunity or an industry that I would ever get involved in because that's not where it was at the time. Uh, it wasn't until the 90s of the advent, as I said, of uh, cigar aficionado and a term we use in the United States, yuppies, started picking up cigars, um, that I had always smoked cigars as a young man. I was the only man my age in my group of friends that even smokes, they all looked at me like I was crazy. Um, like, why are you smoking cigar? Well, his family's Cuban. They, you know, it's it's a Cuban thing. You know, if I guess if I was French, they would have expected me to walk around with a glass of wine. So, <laughs> but uh, 
suddenly I became the subject matter expert because they all wanted to learn more about cigars uh, because of the, the boom that occurred. And um, as a result, I started teaching them how to cut a cigar, how to light a cigar, how to smoke a cigar. And then suddenly, after all these people were asking me, they said, hey, could we get some of your cigars that you smoke? And I was getting them from family. These were coming to me from family. Uh, and I said, well, here's one. And then they said, can I get another? And can I buy a bundle? I don't sell, these, these are given to me. And at that point, I started thinking very sharply about, is there an opportunity here for a business for our family that's now in the United States to return back to our heritage and our legacy that we had left? And um, I approached my father and my uncle, because I was in my mid-20s at the time, and I couldn't do this on my own accord, financially or otherwise. And I approached them and said, listen, if I invest everything I have, basically, you know, would you be interested in becoming partners and getting back? It's, they were both born in Cuba. They both grew up in Cuba. So they knew what, what it was. They were, they looked at each other and they said, if you invest everything you own, because then we'll know your secrets. And we will go ahead and uh, become your partners and we'll start this off. And that's what we did. So we started kicking things around. I was figuring things out, learning things, 96, 97, 98, we incorporated. And that's when we actually became at the time, Los Blancos Cigar Company, which means the Blancos Cigar Company because it was my father, my uncle, and myself. So that's how Blanco Cigars came about in this iteration in the 90s, free, you know, other than what we had in Cuba with the family back then. So from then, it's been a long and twisted winding road the past 22 years. Um, I'm going to go ahead and light up my cigar, by the way. I don't know what you guys are smoking. But let me light up and then I'll continue with the story. If you have any questions, I don't know if you want to pop in. Give me a second to light up. Definitely. Please go ahead. So, um, David, what's also fascinating to me is like you're, you're describing your family background and, and that rich heritage that you had in the family. But at an early age, you took a, a different path in life and you, you actually worked in, in, in civil service, right? Um, in Chicago first, and then in, in the army, from, from what I understand, and, and later on as, as in the fire department as well. Um, w would you say that was a, sort of a, a quintessential and critical um, sort of experience for you um, in order to, you know, find your way around the, the, the entrepreneurial world and find your way around cigars and, and really, you know, getting some different uh, experiences and different exposure in life and only later on sort of uh, finding the, the way into the family heritage and starting with cigars. Well, um, for, I'm going to answer your question, but I'm smoking. I, I have to comment because I know a lot of you guys are from Europe. Some of you might be from the United States, but here it is a, a very solemn weekend. Um, it's the, seen as the kickoff of, uh, of summer, but this is also a very a uh, solemn weekend with the uh, holiday of Memorial Day, which is tomorrow. So uh, this entire weekend we have Memorial Day and I am smoking our new cigar, which I dedicate to the heroes that have fallen uh, serving our country, whether it be police, EMS, fire, and or military. And thank you for those of you. I see a bunch of you are smoking above and beyond. This is the above and beyond. So Amazing. those of you that are smoking it realize that this is the holiday that we remember these heroes and, uh, Salud. I'm going to smoke it with you. Um, now, uh, to answer your question, um, <clears throat> I, I grew up as an American kid growing up in Chicago and all Cuban heritage. That being said, cigar industry was not in the vocabulary or even an option growing up, as I mentioned. That was not a, wasn't something that anybody aspired to because my, my family that had come here had to integrate into the United States. And become American citizens mm -hmm. and do something to make a living. That being said, I grew up wanting to be in the police. I want to be a policeman and I wanted to be a soldier. So uh, out of high school, I joined the United States Army and uh, did my service there. I, I got out of the, uh, once I earned my, my GI Bill, which is a uh, part of the benefits you get as serving in the military, they pay for your your college. So I continued to serve as a reservist while I went to, to university. And um, I just couldn't just do one thing, which was stay in school. So I started looking for work 
and I wanted to be the police. So I joined the Cook County Sheriff's Department, which is the county uh, that includes Chicago. So I became a deputy sheriff. Um, at that point, uh, I was offered a job because I put my name on a bunch of civil service lists, as most people do, because there are so many departments out there and there's so many applicants. You kind of have to go with the ones that uh, accept you. I was then uh, given an opportunity to transfer to the Chicago Police or the Chicago Fire Department. And after being a deputy sheriff, I realized I wanted nothing more to do with law enforcement. <laughs> <laughs> Even though my degree from the university was in criminal justice, one of them, I had three, criminal justice, political science, and paramedic medicine. So I decided to go to the fire department and use that paramedic medicine uh, and license. So that's what I did. While I was there, and now we're talking mid-90s, right? 95, 96. This is when the boom is occurring. I'm smoking cigars, and now suddenly everybody else around me is smoking cigars. So it was at that point that I saw the opportunity possibly to get back into it. At 96, I started scratching my head. 96, 97, I brought it to my family. 98, we decided to actually open because it took some time to coordinate and figure out logistics and everything else. So it wasn't that I joined the civil service uh, to find some other things. That's what I wanted to do in life. And I, became, you know, I was educated to do those things. Um, cigars for me were a hobby mm -hmm. and a link to my family legacy, always being a cube, right? Um, that we were cut off of. This came about as an opportunity only because of what was going on in the world with the cigar industry as it was growing by leaps and bounds for me to reconnect and my father and my uncle both to reconnect to, our, to the legacy that we've lost back in the island. And that's what we did. Um, and we we're doing very well in 98 kicked it off, had our own factory in uh, Ybor City in Tampa. Um, and two years after that, in 2000, unfortunately, my uncle had some uh, medical problems that uh, he became ill. And as a result of his military service, he was a 20-year veteran as well, a Vietnam veteran, as a matter of fact. He was exposed to Agent Orange, and he suddenly couldn't walk anymore as a result of his exposure. Uh, so we had to close the factory. This was a cat catastrophe. One of what turned out to be a few, <laughs> but the first. Mm -hmm. So uh, at that point, we had to figure out after two years of growing steadily. And at that time, there weren't a lot of boutique brands. We were one of the first and one of the early ones. And we had quite a, a, a considerable amount of momentum built because we were one of the first. This was a novelty thing again boutiques right was so, there even like a, a determinus boutique brand back then i guess not right um i don't recall if we actually used the word boutique um but we were definitely one of the i think we were just considered a small company <laughs> 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 um so we we were in a quandary as a result of where what do we do with manufacturing so we happened to call up my my father called up his cousin Remember I told you the family split and some of the family went to Nicaragua mm -hmm. and Honduras to grow tobacco. Well, we had been buying the material from them and assembling it here in our factory in Ybor City. But now that was no longer an option. So we called them up and asked, listen, Frank, my, my uncle's name was Francisco. So we said, Frank is no longer to, to walk. He can't uh, operate a factory day-to-day -day operations. So uh, you mind if we move our operation to your facility? Can we work out of your factory? And they said, absolutely, come on down. You know, we're there, yeah, absolutely. Your family, and this was, this was a family that was lost to us, part of the family that was lost to us. So it was, it was an opportunity to reconnect to the family, um, which I was, I'm very, very happy to say we had that opportunity. Um, so I'm talking so much, I didn't even get to smoke my cigar. Hold on. <laughs> but I mean, that's the wonderful thing about cigars, isn't it? It has a, a unifying quality and, and ability, like it, just as we, we experience here at the Light em Up Lounge and with every hearth that we do, or whenever we, we meet people uh, around the industry, you know, but as you mentioned, it, it can even have a, a family 
re reunion effect. I mean, that's Absolutely. I, Absolutely. I, I wish I could tell you that. I mean, at the time, I thought this was a very unique experience for me, you know, and it was for me, uh, because not only did I have family that I got to, to reconnect with in Nicaragua and Honduras, mm -hmm. but I also had family I never met in Cuba. It was shortly after that I was given an opportunity to travel to Cuba and meet my family there. Uh, and I've since gone back a couple of times, but I haven't been back for a while. Uh, I actually got to see my great grandmother turn 100. Um, I, would, I went back on her birthday. So I got to visit and, and meet cousins. So in that regard, it was very, um, it, was, it was a very nice experience to find a part of this family that you thought you'd lost forever and thought you'd never see. Um, but you're right. So uh, Francisco had to retire um, because of his illness. My father continued as the president. I was at the vice president at the time. He was handling all legal administrative issues, licensing taxes, uh, so bill paying, so forth. I was handling product development, product design, blending the cigars themselves, uh, marketing, advertising, and sales. So I was a, wearing many hats, uh, and I, my father sure wasn't going to be going on the road. That was up to me. So um, the cousins took over, and for those of you that are not aware, some of you are, and some of you have actually been to the factory. That factory in Nicaragua, their surname is Placencia. So Nestor uh, Placencia and my father, Nestor Sr., are cousins. I call him uncle as a sign of respect because he's my father's generation. He's the, a generation older than me. Uh, I wouldn't presume to call him cousin. Now his son, Nestor Andres, Nestor Jr., as some of you refer to him, uh, I call him cousin, right? Because we're the same age. We're about four years apart. Um, so we've been working out of the Placencia factory. I have pretty much carte blanche of that I've had for years now. And this is where I met my mentor, um, who, who's the one who taught me everything I, I, knew, I know now, or at least how to learn and continue to, to expand my horizons and blending of tobacco, which is my forte. Uh, but to do that, I had to learn some about farming, a lot about fermentation, and obviously some about construction. And blending is its own. That's, those are the four links in the chain that I, I often explain to people that are necessary in having a, a, a quality premium cigar. You have to grow great tobacco. We all know the Placentias grow great tobacco. So I have that. Fermentation is the next step. It's an expertise all by itself. And they have very good people working in fermentation. And I had to delve into that because I had to understand how it changed the tobacco from the farm to the fermentation process because I could use the same tobacco and do different things to it in fermentation to get different product materials to use. Blending uh, is what I, what I decided to uh, focus on and I met my mentor early on in 2000. Uh, his name was Avelio Oviedo Dominguez. In this industry, anybody who has been around for any length of time, uh, that man is an icon. A lot of people don't know him because as a consumer, um, you don't usually see the guys behind the curtains, like the Wizard of Oz, right? You see the, the front man, the face, mm -hmm. the uh, Nick Perdomos and the Rocky Patels and the uh, Zeno Davidoffs and the, the David Blancos of the world, right? Um, so you don't get to peer behind the curtain. He, uh, this gentleman, uh, I had about almost 10 years with to learn as much as I could as a sponge. He unfortunately passed, and I think in 2000, late 2009. Um, but I have him on my wall. You know, you can't see that wall over there, but he's always looking at me, watching me with a cigar in his hand. And I always, I have him there so to always remember uh, the legacy that he left. Uh, for, just to give you a little background of who he was. Uh, he was actually the cigar uh, or the rolling union president of all the rollers in Cuba before the revolution. He was also the production quality control head at the H. Upman factory before the revolution. And here you go, guys. He's credited for blending the Monte Cristo one and number two. He's the man. He's the man who created the mythical Monte Cristo number two, apparently. So that being said, and not to mention a whole bunch of others, for those of you in, in uh, Europe, the Daneman artist line was his blend. Uh, he used to be 
doing tours through Europe in his later days for Daneman when they were bringing rollers around. And he, he had his picture on the wall in Hyanius in Amsterdam. And, and he was a legend in his own right. Um, but unfortunately, we lost him. But what he did is he taught me not only how to blend, but how to continue to learn how to blend because you never stop learning in this business. And things change. Where we grow tobacco, how we process tobacco. Um, hybrids of tobacco. We are constantly doing different things with tobacco to innovate and bring something new out there. And regions alone change, you know, the soil content changes how things taste. So um, along with the Placentias, I got to meet another long lost family, part of the family with the Fernandezes. You guys are familiar with the Fernandezes, right? I think you had AJ on the other day. Absolutely. Yes. We okay. Did. So he would be a cousin by marriage and his, his uncle, uh, God bless him, who's no longer with us, died tragically a couple of years ago. Uh, Ahmed Fernandez is actually, was actually the factory manager at Placencia where we worked. So I, I grew up uh, with him as, uh, as a mentor as well uh, for about 18 years. So he passed, uh, tragically passed very young. Uh, we all miss him. But um, so it's a loose knit family oriented uh, operation and a bunch of your guys I see watching here were actually at the factory, and I know a bunch of the other ones looking want to go. So, um, including my buddy Don on the screen, I see Don over there. There's a couple Dons. Don Cross, <laughs> my buddy Don in Texas as well, wearing a Blanco hat. Don Cross is wearing a Blanco shirt. I love you guys. I love you guys. Thank you so much. And David, and I can I, tell you, we have so many more people and I'm sure so many more Dons tuning in over on Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> There's plenty of people watching. And many people say hello. Even Gabby, Gabby Kaifi, Kaifi said hello. He was watching. Hey, Gabby. How you doing, buddy? Good Pleasure to, to have all you guys on. It means a lot. He's not too far from me. Gabby's uh, in the Miami area. I'm in the Tampa area. I'm actually in Clearwater, which is right next door. And interestingly enough, he also had a, a tremendous career before he got into the... the, the Gabby? Oh, yeah. A doctor. He's a doctor. Exactly. Um, so very nice uh, gentleman, by the way. I'm very curious because you, you describe you you have all that rich heritage in your family. You have all the background. You know all these people down there at the Placencia factory, which is actually the cathedral, right? Correct. Um, so you have all these connections, but then you start off totally fresh in the cigar industry. What was sort of your first inspiration? Did you have like specific sensory memories from your childhood days or probably from your father and grandfather smoking cigars or did you just start off with 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 a totally new approach and be like well well i mean i always had like i said growing up there was always a part of you know my world you know cigars were always there the aroma and you, know, you ever talk to ladies sometimes they'll enter a cigar how it reminds me of my grandfather right well i always had those memories growing up mm -hmm. so um and I had been smoking as a young adult. So I grew up in my own experience as a consumer, right? I just happened to have family in the business. And when I decided to uh, enter, I, I had ideas of what I wanted to do. But it's funny you ask that because that's the first thing that Velio asked me. Now, I had made cigars and blended cigars, learning my own way when I was in the States with my own factory. However, when I went to Nicaragua and I met a Velio, he asked me, he goes, so you're going to blend cigars here? I said, yeah. He goes, I'm the master blender at the factory. So, well, I'm going to learn everything I can from you. Uh, and he worked with me and he worked with me for a very long time until his death. And um, the first thing he asked me, he goes, so we're in the blending room, which some of you have been there. And he said, so uh, what do you want to do? How do you want to start? What do you want to make? I said, uh, you know, I was in awe of him, number one. And I was kind of like, blanked out i was kind of like i i want to make a good cigar that's all i could say right so he said well let me help you out uh what kind of wrapper would you like to use? what kind of notes and tones would you like to impart into this cigar with taste uh how about the aroma what what would you like to impart in the aroma and of course would you like it mild medium or full body and i was like oh so i had to learn how to define with words Put into words what I was trying to create uh, in a cigar. And for those that have come down to my tour, they know that I put them on the spot the same way because this is how I learned. You know, people say, oh, that's a great cigar. And I go, why? What makes a, a great cigar to you? Because by the way, it's all subjective, right? 
everybody has their own ideas of what a good cigar, a bad cigar, taste, aroma. It's all relevant to from me to you to the next guy. So explain to me what you like in a cigar and what that is in taste and aroma. Define it. And you'd be surprised how many people start scratching their heads and going, uh, and then I get them to think. And then we smoke individual tobaccos and I ask them, what do you taste? And they still kind of hesitate until I start planning some words for them to define because when we have tastes and aromas in cigars, we refer to them as to something else, similar. Cocoa, oak, cedar, leather, got citrus. These are all descriptions of other things that we, our receptors uh, in, interpret as similar tastes or flavors or aromas. So I'm trying to get them to yank out of their memory bank what those things are that they're referring to when they smoke a cigar. That's a very good, an amazing point that you're bringing up here. I mean, for, for me, sensory is, is one of the biggest aspects of my life and, and a lot of what I do personally and professionally. And I would say that um, it's like building your own repertoire or your own vocabulary in order to, to, to verbalize the things that, that you're perceiving and, and these you're building your sensory database in your head. And afterwards you go on a treasure hunt and, and whatever you're perceiving through your senses, you try to sort of make shareable uh, with other people through verbalizing them. And it's tricky for a lot of people to sort of oh. find that, that vocabulary. You should right? come on a tour and see how tricky it is. Renee, how tricky is it? Yeah, he's, he's muted, but he's shaking his head. Yeah, Thomas. Thomas has been down a couple of times. He's shaking his head. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And let me what tell you about. Tell me, Tom, tell me, tell me. How, go ahead, Renee. Say something. Well, all the the little cigars, the unwrapped cigars, you need to taste it to get the blends together. It's so difficult. And for a uh, uh, for a normal cigar smoker, actually, for me, they all taste the same. But when you cut the, the different uh, leaves together. From the different grounds, you cut every time another taste, and that's great. That's, that's really great. It's very, it's a very difficult process. So I, I, I cherish every cigar now more than I did before because I know what the the, the work is for everyone to uh, to create a cigar from uh, picking the leaves and growing the leaves from picking them and to get them. To the shops and everything it's yeah it's great i'm very impressed by it by the process only yeah so part of this uh, part of this process that i go with these guys is what he's referring to is the porritos they're they're pure one leaf little cigarillo size right and we smoke them visually uh seco and ligero you know actually we go seco viso ligero and then we have four regions in, uh, in nicaragua and we, they're all habano Right, so we have the same plant grown in four different areas of the country, and then we smoke the three variations of leaf from bottom to top, and we do that individually, and then we start combining take them, and we see if we can pick out. It's kind of like what people do as as sommeliers with wine, yep. where they can taste and identify the regions of the grapes. Well, you'd be surprised. You know, if I smoke a cigar and, and I say, oh, that's from Jalapa or that's from um, Ometepe or that's from Esteli, it's because and somebody will go, yeah, this guy doesn't, how does he know that, right? Because I smoke a lot of tobacco from that area. And they have very specific tastes and aromas that impart flavor and or, or aroma to it. Some are more floral. Some are more citric. Some are more earthy. So if you have smoke in those and you work with them constantly throughout the years, you can identify them. And once we, we do this with the, with the people who come on the tour during this aspect of the tour, even they are starting to, aim after that day, we, we combine different tobaccos and when we have the guessing game. So what are you smoking now? What have you, and then I can have them go back and smoke the porito and then smoke the cigar that we blended. And then they can start picking out, ah, that's what I like out of this cigar. Or this is what I like. So now it helps them identify what they actually enjoy out of the tobacco in that actual cigar. So they can say, 
I like for the re why I why do I like Nicaraguan cigars? Because I like tobacco from Jalapa for Esteli. You know, they can be very precise about the why they like Nicaraguan tobacco. Because they don't like all Nicaraguan tobacco necessarily. They make like certain regions. And if those cigars that they like have those regions in them, if they can research those, then they go and try those cigars because they know that might be something they're interested in. So it, it's you, similar to wine. You, you just described um, the, the process and the way you, you were taught how to, how to go into blending. Do you still take that very same approach when you think about a new cigar line? Or could it also be a totally different inspiration where, you, where you're like, um, I have this certain theme, core theme, or, or a concept that I want to create a cigar for? Like, I guess with Above and Beyond probably was the concept first, the idea first, and then you start to build the blend around that. But what, what does that process look like for you? So the marketing and packaging and uh, that kind of aspect of the cigar is completely separate to the actual product itself from my perspective. So when I begin blending or I'm looking to blend a product, it has to do with what niche in the smoking arena am I looking to fill? Am I looking to make a mild, a medium, a full body? And then the niches within that, am I looking for a smooth, creamy, mild cigar or a peppery full body cigar? What if I'm making it for myself that is a Blanco brand? And I say that because I make cigars for about 12 different companies. And in regards to that, they come to me and they tell me what I make them verbalize it. They get to learn how to do this. And then it's my job to interpret that into tobacco for them. So it's about what do you want to make? So going back to the story with my mentor, the first cigar I ever blended, he goes, well, how do you want to start? What do you want to do? And I thought to myself, the first thing I do when I get up is have a cup of coffee. So I guess I should probably blend a cigar for that. And that was the first cigar that I blended. So we didn't want it too full body, right? We, knocked, we, we started knocking things out of the park. We didn't want it to be a Maduro. So we were saying, okay, how about a medium body cigar? Uh, we're going to do a lighter to medium shade wrapper. So it was like, okay, do you want a sun grown or do you want a, do you want a shade grown? And I said, well, I don't want to do a shade grown. And I didn't want to do a Connecticut for my morning cigar. So we ended up deciding on using a Sumatran wrapper, Indonesian Sumatran for my first cigar. And that was the Blanco Premier Selection, uh, Sumatra. And then we used Nicaraguan Honduran fillers uh, that we had plentiful you know, amounts of. And we came out to a beautiful cigar with a nice cocoa finish because it was about pairing that particular cigar with a beverage. So sometimes you're looking to do that. And sometimes you're making the cigar not, in, not necessarily taking into consideration that it's being paired for a certain beverage. So a lot of cigars don't do that. And I don't do that with all my cigars either. But there are pairings that, and for that particular cigar, we were definitely in looking directly towards pairing it for coffee. So we had something with a little spice, a little bit of a cocoa finish, a little bit of a woodiness. We didn't want any earthiness. And we, we ended up with a great cigar for that. So it all depends on where you're coming from. And you can come from anywhere, like you said. Um, I usually come from where do, what kind of niche and sometimes, am I making a cigar specifically for a beverage to pair with? And I've been asked to do that. I used to, I used to have a client that owned a vineyard, and he brought three different wines to me and said, I want a cigar to pair with each one of these wines. Well, we drank them, and we tried to pair with them, pairing uh, different tobaccos with them. Because the thing about pairing is you don't want a beverage to overwhelm the tobacco or the other way around. That's why it's called pairing. We want it. If they're, if they're both strong, if the, if the beverage is strong, if you're starting from there, you want the tobacco to be strong with it to meet it. You don't want it underwhelm because one will ruin the other. In an underwhelming cigar or an underwhelming beverage with a cigar, it's not a good pair. And that's the key. So there's different ways to approach it. And then I, I always say, like, it's it's not just a cigar. It's not just a pairing, right? I mean, cigars are an experience. And experience is, is happening on a multisensory basis. And mm -hmm. everything comes into play here, whether that's visuals, sound, tactile. Even, these are all things we, we got to factor in and, and think about when creating holistic experiences. And it's a wonderful point that you're bringing up, because I think, ultimately, in this day and age, we're living in a world where everything is defined by experience, right? 
the, the product itself is, is highly commoditized these days. Oh, There's yeah. so many options out there. And ultimately, you're, you're always going to end up in, in sort of a pricing game where, where you're just trying to be cheaper than the other guy. Unfortunately, yeah. I think the market is oversaturated. I think there are way too many cigars out there. I mean, we're in the golden age of premium cigars. Don't get me wrong. However, anybody with $20,000 in their pocket thinks that they can be a cigar brand. Mm -hmm. This is, this isn't, and they're, and they'll find a factory out there to make them the cigars. You know, I think that we need to become a little bit more selective with how we do business because we are commodity. As you said, it's becoming just a commodity uh, rather than a handcrafted premium uh, artisan product that by the way, takes years and years and years to perfect, not just make perfect. You can make a cigar, but to perfect the process with the four links in the chain that I was talking about, tobacco growing, fermentation, blending and rolling. If you have, if your link is weak in any of those four, your product is not, it's not going to come out right. And it's going to be substandard and it won't be considered premium. And that being point? said, you know, it's just, there's a lot of people out there now. At what point along your personal journey did you feel like I'm getting used to it? We're getting there. You know, you, you get more experience. You, you start to get into the whole blending uh, side of things. Uh, at what point did you feel like a, a little more uh, assured, self-assured with what you were doing? Well, first, I try never to be comfortable because when you get comfortable, you get complacent. And if you get complacent, then you, you lose the fire, right? Um, however, I understand the purpose of the question, so I can answer the best this way. When people started uh, reordering my cigars in large quantities for their shops, uh, for example, that told me that uh, the consumers were enjoying my product. And I see this and view this as my art. I can't paint, I can't sculpt, I can't draw, you know, I can't do any of those other things that artists do, sing, play an instrument, whatever. So I blend and my cigars are my art. And so when I see that people are enjoying my art, that's when I get a little bit more confident that I'm doing something right. And I couldn't have done that without my mentor. But what he told me always was never stop learning, never stop trying to push the envelope and try to do something different or find different materials out there to work with and try to just don't do the same thing that the Cubans did every time. You know, I, could, I mean, he grew up with, and he's Cuban, Died in, I think he was 88 when he died, but it was like the Cubans became stagnant because they never ended up changing anything uh, and becoming more adept at what they did. So uh, I'm not, and that's not to say if you have a good product, don't stick with a good product, but it's nice to continue to grow as an artist, right? Like any artist does. And that's what he was trying to impart to. So that being said, um, I think when people started expanding the distribution of my product, I knew that I was doing something right. Mm -hmm. um, then after 10 years in Europe, now I have 10 years in Europe distribution. Uh, after about five, six years, I started getting some traction there. And I say five, six years, which is about the normal time in Europe because they do business there a little bit differently, a little bit slower paced. And getting a foothold was a little bit more difficult, but I persisted and, and persevered. And uh, we started gaining traction and now we're, we're growing even in Europe and other markets throughout the world as a matter of fact. So the success breeds the confidence that you must be doing something right. Because I can tell you, I can look back at a magazine like Cigar Aficionado now from the 90s and it's like a graveyard of brands and companies. They just don't exist anymore. Um, so to have lasted 22 years and continue to expand and grow. And by the way, we did it the old fashioned way with our own money. I don't know anything to a bank. I don't have 20 investors. I am 100% lock, stock, and barrel here. This is my office, by the way. Uh, I own this. And before that, it was my father and I. So we didn't invest the multi-millions of dollars to ad for advertising campaigns and swag and all this. We couldn't afford it. And after a few setbacks in the industry, which we'll get to in the story, um, we had to retool things and ended up working on a shoestring. And it was by good old fashioned hard work, hitting the pavement, making the relationships in this industry is based on relationships, which is why we do things like this. Um, that is how we persevere uh, and, and, and succeed. 
I think there was a there was a, a ceiling that I broke through with regard to your question with the confidence level and when did I think that, you know, how things changed in my head. When I had people come to me that enjoyed my cigars and asked me to make cigars for them, I think that was a turning point. Great point. They said, Dave, we love your cigars. Could you make a brand for me? Uh, I said, well, are you serious? Because that's number one for me. I'm looking for long-term relationship for people that are interested in doing this business not like those guys that I just mentioned that are gone in cigar aficionado. For me, this is not a quick make a buck deal. This is my livelihood and it's, I'm the fifth generation. My plan is to turn this over to the sixth generation. Larger, better healed and, and more well-rounded while it's in my care. That's my job is to grow for the next generation. Okay. So when I started making cigars for other people, I think that that's when uh, things change for us because the credibility had been earned and that takes time. You have to have the only way to get credibility in this industry is to earn it. You know, you can, you can flash uh, advertising in all kinds of magazines and, and make yourself bigger than life. But at the end of the day, people go, hey, that's a new company. I never really heard of it, but you know, the good ones, right? They've been around for a while. They've earned the respect. You know, I think marketing and, and social media have all one thing in common. They do not make you or your brand better or worse. They just expose you on a, awareness. On a level. Yeah. And ultimately, awareness. About, can you deliver with the product mm -hmm. or not? Mm -hmm. We have a lot of questions and, and comments coming in. Um, I would like Fine. to bring in Ian, who had a question for quite some time. Hi, David. We... Um... We met in Boysdale uh, last year in London. Yes. And, uh, you, you, you reached into your backpack and found a, a T-shirt that was my size, which uh, I would be, would be wearing today if um, I had it, but it's in my apartment in London. I'm just trying to show, share a picture with you if I can find it of me and the T-shirt. But I had a question. I don't know if this is going to come up on the screen. If we can all see yeah, that. hold on. The screen's kind of changed on me here. How's your screen looking, Reinhardt? You got everybody up there? If you got me on the screen anyway. Yes, Ian was just trying to share his screen, but uh, I guess the picture's not coming up. Okay. No worries. Uh, so it was me, me with, the, with, the, with, the, with your t shirt in Nicaragua at the festival, which uh, I really enjoyed. Uh, you sort of answered the question. I mean, well, like other people, I often find very hard to tell the difference between different cigars, uh, but I often like to have a mild cigar, and most cigars now tend to be medium to medium strong. You know, for instance, I had a great Fonseca Cuban cigar, and it was just wonderful. And I've had David off the wonderful. What mild cigars do you make, and what mild cigars do you like? Um, well, the reason, and I'm not saying it's bad to not, I mean, people enjoy all types of cigars, mild, medium, and full. But what tends to happen is that the longer you smoke, the, the more developed your palate becomes. Um, if I was to equate this to wine again, and I use wine often as an analogy because people are very familiar with wine, right? So I would say that, oh, what the, yeah, that's a nice cigar right there. <laughs> you shared the photo. I'm seeing it now. Wow. <laughs> so what happens is that if you like a red wine, if you, if you find out that you like to drink red wine, you usually start out at a, at a crispy, lighter, fruity type of red wine. And then as you progress in your, in your experimenting with the wines, you get darker, deeper, and drier, right? You wouldn't start off if you've never had, had red wine with a, with a very dry red, right? You'd probably be like, oh, I can't stand it, and I, I wouldn't smoke, I wouldn't drink it. It's kind of that way with tobacco. The palate is not used to tobacco, you develop it. And you develop with, you, with milder tobaccos. So most people, when they start smoking, they start milder and then they grow into the medium and full body. We have now more than ever, I think, in our industry, it, some of the more educated palates with, when it comes to consumers than we've ever had. And we have more of them because in part, social media. Social media educates people as to what they're smoking, where they're getting their tobacco, the tobacco from, what they like, kind of like the process I just went through. That being said, if you're a smoker for a long duration of time, you kind of tend to get away from the mild cigars. 
However, from time to time, you like to switch it up. I get it. So if you're going to smoke a mild cigar from Blanco, uh, I would say that probably the lightest cigar that I have is the Blanco Liga Exclusiva de Familia in Connecticut, which is this one right here. Oh, uh, Ray's smoking one as we speak. He's just folding it up on the screen. Um, that box looks like that. Okay. Okay. This cigar was actually a blend that I created for my father because he likes milder to medium cigars. It's got a Connecticut shade from Honduras that the Placencias grow in the Talanga Valley. And it's all Nicaraguan filler binder. However, I'm not using Visos and Lijeros. I'm using some more Secos in there. Um, so it, it has flavor, but it's not smoking air, but it's not strong. So it's still mild in strength, but medium in flavor. That is to say, you're going to get something out of it, but it's very smooth, has some creaminess to it, a little bit of a nuttiness to it, a little woody to it, but nothing really heavy. Uh, another cigar I make that is not available in the European market is the Primo's Classic in Connecticut, which I have here somewhere. This one. Now, I make this cigar with this band for the Dutch market for a good friend of mine, uh, but it's a different blend. Now, hers is still kind of mild again, so if she would like, her, she owns tobacco dough in Holland, and I know you're in the UK. So I believe that she ships uh, international. And if you wanted to check out tobaccodo.nl, she might see that band with a Connecticut shade wrapper on it. That would be another option for you. Um, those are probably the Connecticut's that I find are the mildest cigars that I make. Like you said, though, I make a lot more medium uh, profile cigars because like anything else, that's where the bell curve of cigar smokers are, the masses of smokers. There's not too many mild, and there's really not as many full bodies. I see somebody, Don's holding up the 9JT Limitado with my full body cigar. He's holding up a band that's 100% Lajero. So that's the only cigar that I make that's 100% Lajero. Uh, it's full flavor, but not, it's not going to punch you in the mouth because we use early priming tobacco in that blend. That means we pick the Lajero early, so it hasn't developed and matured and become as thick as it normally would had we left it on and picked it last in the seventh prime or something of that nature. Do you so, also go through prolonged fermentation or aging with that type well, of tobacco in order to oh, bring yeah. it to the level? I make that cigar in one size, and the reason it's in one size is because I got the blend in about two weeks correct. It took me two years how to, to figure out how to get it to burn correctly because the combustion on six Six differently heroes is what's in that cigar. It took me that long to figure out the ratios of the different fermentation times between the different varietals of tobacco that I was using. Once I figured it out, I said, I'm never going to do that again. <laughs> so the JT Limitado will never be in another size. It's a six and a quarter by 58 ring gauge. And that only came about because people were asking me to make the Blanco 9 in a big ring gauge. Mm -hmm. And when I just expanded the, the ring gauge on that cigar, the blend went flat because it was just too much filler in ratio for the wrapper, which is an Escudo Coro. So I had to retool that blend using the same three core Lajeros. I had to add another one for mass. So I kept the, the strength level and actually amped it up. At that point, I was like, man, I got four Lajeros. I said, let's see, can we change the binder to a binder that's a Lajero binder? Because I was using a Viso binder. So I used the same varietal. I just put it higher in the plant. So I used a Lajero binder. I could not find a Corojo because what we use on the nine is a, an Escudo Corojo wrapper. And it's a Viso as well. But So I couldn't find that in the Lajero. So we changed the wrapper to a Habano Lijero wrapper. And it's a Escudo. So it looks similar in color as the, as the Corojo, but it's actually a Lijero from a, a Habano variety. So six different Lijeros. I only make them in 10 count boxes and Don and I know a bunch of other guys. I'm actually sold out of them right now. It's the only skew in my entire arsenal that I have that's sold out. And it's, and I'm in, I'm in a back order situation because of the COVID we can't get things up here as quickly as we'd like to, because transportation right now is, is limited. And everybody's trying to get something out here from every factory and 
in Nicaragua and Honduras and everywhere else. So, mm -hmm. but we have them made and uh, we just, I've probably got hundreds of boxes on back order right now. And I, I tell them, I say, guys, they're ready to smoke. I just can't get them into the United States at the moment. So hopefully shortly. Another question from David. David, please bring that one up. You asking me to bring it up? There, hi. Hi, thank you, David. Hello from Buffalo Grove, Illinois. Hey, <laughs> go Cubs. It, it finally, uh, Sox fan. It, ah, it finally- Get him off the screen. Get him off the screen. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, be, being a Sox fan is like having a cold. You just never feel good. <laughs> Except this year, I think, you know what? They suckered me in. I bought a, a season pass. I bought a 10 game season pass. Finally, right? Well, they're doing great this year. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't lost. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> What's your question, buddy? About the uh, FDA issues and the cigar rights, are they, what is your vision on that? How's that going? Oof. Nobody knows. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is nobody knows is that you can never tell with the government, right? We've spent right. millions of dollars in, in, in fighting this legislation. It's not legislation. Let me rephrase that. Uh, regulation. Uh, it's, it's a regulation as a result of a, um, a executive overreach, basically. There is legislation involved what they're basing it on, which was from 2007, uh, that had to do with FDA regulating cigarettes. And uh, Obama's last hurrah in office before he left, or one of them, was to expand and overreach the fact that since that legislation involved the FDA regulating the cigarette industry, that therefore that somehow meant all tobacco. When they specifically wrote in the, in the, in the law, cigarettes. So what he did was an illegal overreach in our view. And, but of course with the government, you gotta now prove it and you gotta prove that in court or legislation that counters that. So we've been fighting this, unfortunately for years now. Um, We've had some, some successes. Um, however, the road is not over and we have another hurdle in September, which is the big one that could change the industry forever, which is the uh, submission of the, uh, they call them grandfathered or substantial equivalency uh, documentation, which means that if you had a product on the market after 2007, which is the grandfathering period, February something, that you had to have all this type of testing, um, scientific data and testing regarding the elements of the smoke in the cigar, which is what they do for cigarettes, which is why they just implemented the same thing for us as they did for cigarettes. But if you're aware, you can't do that with ours because it's 100% leaf. Cigarettes are not, there's paper, right. They add chemicals, which is why they have this process because they want to know what's in the cigarette, right? They add chemicals, they add processes, they do, they add nicotine. So the nicotine levels are up. All of these things, the FDA wanted to know what's in the cigarettes. Well, so they said, well, we want the same thing from the cigars now. We had never done any of this type of testing for cigars. This is going to be ridiculously expensive. And what it would do is kill a lot of the younger brands because they couldn't afford to do it. It will cause the larger companies to cut back on SKUs because if from a financial perspective and business perspective, if that Vitola or that size or that line just isn't making enough money to warrant to go through this testing, they'll just eliminate it. Not to mention new blending and new products would have to go through a process to get approved first before they could enter the market. And by the way, uh, since they enacted this legislation with the cigarette industry, there hasn't been one new product approved. So what do you think the chances of getting a new product approved in cigars? Are? It's anything rigged. we can do. Any, what can we do? I mean, I joined the cigar rights of America and I filled out yes. that FDA form. Yes. And contact your congressman and senator and tell them that you're a cigar smoker and you want the FDA out of uh, managing the uh, my life, my life. Yeah, well, it's all government. managing my life. It's all government. Government, uh, big government. That's what they do. They want to know how right. much sugar you're consuming, and they'll restrict that. And how much salt, they'll restrict that. It's the nanny state. So nanny I don't want to talk too much right. politics because it's a losing okay. argument in forums like this. But you can probably know why I moved out of Chicago. 
Right. I know. I get it. I get it. Hey, when I when I come down to Florida, can I look you up? Absolutely. Anybody that right. ever comes down here is welcome. Dom has been to my office. He's on the screen. Uh, he's been in this office right here. We've had a couple drinks, I think. So, uh, oh, and Don as well. I said Dom, but Don has also been here. Um, who else I got? It? Hey, Smith, what's up, man? My guy, Thank my you. army buddy from uh, from Germany. What's up, bro? So, um, yeah, the FDA is a pain, and we are really fighting to get so there's two ways we can do this. We're fighting uh, legislatively. We have a bill to have an exemption uh, from the FDA. That's one way to do it. Be exempt from the rest of the tobacco products. And the other way is to just fight it in court as uh, not legal with regard to the, this is an overreach from the written legislation that already exists. What we do though, is we don't talk about tobacco as much as we do the jobs. And small business because you can't argue tobacco in today's day and age and today's world. or pot pot is legal pot they're giving it away in Chicago. Oh, that's, this is just this is another this just goes to show you that they're really not the problem is not smoking right right they don't really have a problem with smoking because if it's marijuana they would have the same problem but they don't they don't do that so it's an issue of tobacco and when they say when i say tobacco it's big tobacco it's cigarettes that everybody's got the problem with, but we keep getting crushed as collateral damage because we use Thank the you. same material. But we are like the fine champagne of the tobacco industry. You know, and that's not what they're focusing on, but we get caught up every time. So this pipe tobacco, so this roll your own, so this chew or dip, all of these things get caught up in the legislation. They're hurting all of us. Anyway, I wish it was a brighter outlook. It's not over. We continue to fight. We will fight to the death, but nobody really knows. That's why I say we can't tell. We did win a couple of things, so we could win some more. So we'll see. Many thanks for your question, David. It's a pleasure. I will say this for those of you in the United States. If Trump does not get reelected, this will, we will be in toilet. The, the cigar industry will, will go away as we know it today. Just letting you know. I'm not saying vote for Trump. To, or to save cigars, but I will tell you that the Democratic uh, administrations are not friendly to this idea, uh, which is what brought this all on, which was the Obama administration. The, the, the next Democratic elected uh, um, president, if so is elected, will devastate our industry and not even think twice about it. They could care less. David, good, quick fire question um, be, before we continue with Figo, who is on the show, and I'm always honored to have him. Um, but um, Marvin had two questions. A, he is in Austria, and, and he was asking about uh, availability of your cigars. Unfortunately, from what I know thus far, they're not available in Austria, right? That is correct. We are This, this Dortmund show, if it happens, one of my uh, goals was to expand distribution into Austria. Now, we have people who smoke our cigars in Austria because I see them post all the time. But as I mentioned to you, I think prior, they're getting them from other countries. And I think it's Germany or Switzerland or who knows? I don't even know. Or <laughs> Holland. I, could, I, I have no idea. Marvin's other question was um, regarding box press. Um, I, I think all the above and beyond are box press, correct? Um, do box you actually... press and, and they're all torpedo heads. Do you actually prefer it that way, or is it just for this particular size? Uh, in general, do you enjoy box press or, or parejo? I, it's preference, and it and it really people ask me, well, what's the difference between box press? And, you know, why do you do it? Some people say that if you box press a cigar, it slows the burn because you're compressing the tobacco. A little bit. If that's the case, it's minimal, almost inconsequential. The best thing about a box press is that if I put it on the edge of the table, it won't <laughs> roll off. <laughs> that's that's the biggest benefit of box press uh, sure. some people like the look it's a stacks however the above and beyond is box pressed and torpedoed in all four sizes for a reason there you go down the reason it's box press is because this is again to honor the heroes and as the band has a flag on it so does the coffin and so the coffin is rectangular we made the cigar box pressed emblematic of a coffin with the flag being draped over. And it's torpedoed because we have this cone on it, which by the way, I found out was the first time a cigar had ever had a cone cap. Do you know how hard it is to do something different in this business? 
True. I had no idea that this was the first time it had ever been done. But for me, it was emblematic uh, for those of you that are either American or watch American movies. When somebody is buried with honors, whether it's police, fire, or military, um, the, the flag drapes are caught. And then as the casket begins to get lowered, the flag gets taken off and folded. And you fold the American flag in a triangle. And then it is then presented to the family. And as a thank you for that, their family service and sacrifice. So we wanted this to represent the folded flag. Mm -hmm. And that's why we made them all torpedo. So we have a five by 54, a six by 54, a seven by 54, and a six by 60. All torpedoed and all box pressed. The four sizes are called the four different types of heroes. A willing hero, an unwilling hero, the classic hero, and the epic hero. And if you guys look up those def different definitions, you'll understand the difference between the heroes. Some Very turn out to be heroes. They had no intention, nor did they ever want to be a hero. And some charge right into, the, like a fireman, charge right into that fire knowing that he's probably not coming out. So those are two different types of mentality, two different types of people, and, and they have been defined in different categories. So. Very interesting story. And, and just one comment regarding the box press, because we we're talking about multi-sensory before. I think it also comes down to tactile sensations and, 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 and the touch and the haptics. It's just different sure. by how you perceive it in your mouth. So I think Which is why we have different types of cuts, right? We have a V cut, we have a straight cut, we have a, a punch. And that's, again, down to the tactile. Some people like the cap intact and they don't want to get tobacco in their mouth. Yeah. Perfect. Figo, it's so great to see you, my man. Hope you're doing well. You had a couple of questions and comments. Fire away. David, how are you? Doing well, my friend. How are you doing? Not too bad. Where in Clearwater are you? Uh, where, in the area? Yeah, I live, I'm not there. I'm in, actually in bourbon country right now, but I live in the, uh, Tarpon Springs. Okay, so you go right down 19. I'm at 19 in Almaty. That's the major oh, nice. intersection. You know where Oz nice. is at? Yeah. Okay, so I'm... I'm the that's Almerton. I'm the next street north, which is 142nd, just um, east of 19th. Nice. However, awesome. however, if you're not coming down here in the next two months, I'm I'm breaking some news for everybody right now. This is the first time it's ever been discussed. We are moving our headquarters in the next 60 days. Mm. We're looking to buy a freestanding building, um, not too far from here. We think we found one. We haven't gotten the financing all together and everything else, but we will be moving uh, in the next 60 days. So we have been That's here. Awesome. We've been here for 10 years uh, and we moved to this location from Chicago. So we had 12 years in Chicago, 10 years at this location, and we have now outgrown it. And we're looking at, right now I have a 5,000 square foot space uh, between warehousing and office, but we are looking at a 10,000 square foot building right now with about two and a half acres around. that's great man awesome you heard it here first so, light them up you got it reinhardt I, I saved you something special buddy we're honored thanks <laughs> for sharing <laughs> so you kind of touched on your different vitolas and stuff where do you see um i guess your consumer base as far as you know younger crowd older crowd and then i want you to touch on retro hailing a little bit oh i noticed um you know when we're talking about Viso and Seco and Lajero, um, some people know, some people don't, some people can't get that sensory experience. Sure. But I think, you know, if you can get that sensory experience, mm -hmm. it takes that blend to the whole new level, if you could touch on that. Absolutely. So it's critical, in my opinion, my humble opinion, that <clears throat> everybody at least try and learn how to retrohale because as a blender, I blend, and those of you that have been down there can attest to this, I blend for taste and aroma. If you're only inhaling and exhaling through your mouth, which I call mouth breathing, you're only getting two thirds of the cigar. Simple as that. So I'll use this as an analogy. Uh, if you ever are, have a cold and you're eating your food, it tastes different. It really doesn't taste different. The difference is you usually can't smell it. And the perception in the brain of the taste and the aroma gives you a flavor, flavor. It's actually taste and aroma together. Well, if you take the uh, aromatic sensory away, then you're only getting one. 
and it changes the experience, which is why retrohaling adds an entire dimension, the third, the final third dimension of the cigar. I actually did a video on cigarobsession.com. Brian asked me to do it, Brian Glenn, because I talked about on one of his shows, like what we're doing here, a little bit about retrohaling. And there were a lot of people that didn't know how to retrohale. And that surprised me a little bit because I really never thought about it. It was something that came after me. I thought everybody did it. And so I did a little six minute video on how to do, and I'll, I'll be happy to show you guys and give the class right here. It's real easy. And I got 70,000 views on that thing. I couldn't believe it. I, I was astonished and astounded. I started reading the comments and it was, it was, it was exactly what I had hoped. People were telling me, man, this is a whole new experience. I, I find I enjoy the cigars more. It's changed what I like and what I thought I liked. I don't like anymore. And what I didn't like, I like more now. It brings a whole added value. I tell people, go back and smoke. If you don't retrohale and you start doing it, go back and try the cigars again. And you'll find that it's a completely different experience. You might like them more or less. 100%. So here's how we retrohale. I'll give you the quick and dirty. It's actually three steps, one and then two at the same time. You bring smoke into your mouth. Over-exaggerate what I'm telling you in the beginning so you train your mind to do it. And then you'll be able to, once you get the concept, you won't have to over-exaggerate these issues. Bring the smoke into your mouth, let it sit on your tongue, and clench your jaw. Don't do this. Just let it sit on the tongue, like you're drawing liquid through a straw. After you do that, that's step one. The other two steps at the same time are, since the smoke is sitting on the tongue in the oral pharynx area, you raise the tongue to the top of the palate, right? So you take up the space. Well, if you take up the space where the smoke is and you don't do this, because then it just goes to your cheeks. That's why you got to quench your jaw. The smoke will start traveling back where there's more space. As it travels back, what you do at the same time, remember there's two things, lift the tongue. And the other thing is exhale through your nose like you're blowing your nose. So what will happen is the smoke travels back and it goes around to the, neural, the nasal pharynx and, and travels out the nose, the only other hole in your head. It's pretty simple. Now, you don't have to... So David just froze right in the middle of his master class showing us all how to retrohale that i think that's that's like a pretty epic um sort of freeze right there perfect moment um let's see Reinhard, i'll tell you like it's i think you know one of the as he was touching on it you know it's one of those things that just raises the bar in the sensory experience so as he was trying to say before uh we lost him but uh it's a it's huge <laughs> It's true. And I think one, one other aspect to, to consider is not everybody is enjoying retrohaling all the, the sensory sensation that you will get out of it. I couldn't agree more in that it certainly brings some new elements to your smoking experience and to the overall perception of the cigar. But I'm also aware of the fact that some people enjoy it, some people do not. Um, and and that, that's at least my opinion. And I, I'd be curious to hear what you all think. Um, I'd say that retrohaling is something people can, can get a little geeky on or, or something people tend to overcomplicate because it became sort of a thing to talk about retrohaling. Um, and I would just say, let it come naturally and let it flow naturally. And, and then the experience will be more enjoyable. But please, all, all you guys share your experiences and whether you do or do not retrohale. I mean, we've got so many experienced cigar passionados here. Share some of your thoughts and we'll bring on David in the meantime. Well, I'm, I'm back. I think you guys got Oh, there me. you are. Yeah. So the one thing, I, I lost signal. I have no idea why, but the one thing I was trying to say at the very end there is that by all means, and you alluded to it as I was coming back, is that if you don't like doing it, smoke the cigar the way you enjoy it. But this does add that extra third of a dimension of the, of the cigar. And by the way, if you have a really strong cigar, you might want to be very careful because you're doing this with strong tobacco. And, and the funny part is, yeah, Don Cross, I see him there. The funny part is, is that if you don't retrohale and you say you smoke full body, 
you really haven't experienced what full body is until you retro hail. <laughs> then you really know what full body is. And I've heard people go, I only smoke full body. And then I tried retro hailing. I'm like, I'm a medium body smoker. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, once once that Lajero hits you uh, when you're doing retro hail, uh, it, it'll let you know uh, what's up. That's for sure. So there's my retro hail spiel. I hope that it helps some of you, helps all of you. Um, and for those of you that want to try it and want to do it, I highly recommend it. But again, enjoy your cigar the way you enjoy it. That's that. It's not you have to. And and what I realized after this whole process was, and seeing all the reviews on that YouTube I did, and then I started doing events. I went to events and I said, I just took a poll. I said, how many of you guys retro hail? 10%. And they were all like, I don't know how. I never tried it. I don't like it. They, they, they couldn't figure it out. I started giving classes at every event that I go to. And I realized that as an industry, we have failed drastically. And I, I, I go back to the wine analogy. How many of you have been to wine tastings? They teach you how to cork the bottle. They teach you how to pour the wine and aerate it. And for how long and what temperature and they teach you about the bouquet they teach you what part of the tongue and how much air to bring in when you're trying the, the wine what do we do in our industry here's a cigar here's how you cut it here's how you light it good luck kid that's right. what we do and we have failed to educate people about the retrohaling experience and why it's important because us as blenders put this into the tobacco with the blend for you to experience these things and then we don't tell you about it so that's why i started every event that i go to i start giving a class hmm. on how many guys retro hail and then by the end of the night 90 percent know how to retro hail and they say man i enjoy your cigars much more now well that's the whole point it's to get another a level of enjoyment out of it but again if you don't enjoy it don't do it and david that's an that's an amazing point that you brought up here that you know we could certainly do with, with a lot more educational content and educational experiences in the cigar industry. I mean, we spoke about that with, with Erica from TLE. She's here tonight and I'm glad to see her on the call. Uh, we're going to do a little, little session about some sensory um, experiences pretty soon together. And it would be great to see just more of that. I mean, we had uh, the professor, Jose Blanco on the, the on other the, Blanco. Yes. I saw that, that masterclass <laughs> thing. And, and then Dion Giolito, when he was on the call, he was, he was rolling some little puras for us. And it's just amazing to, to, to learn and get some of your valuable experiences and share that. I mean, we're, we're such a giving industry and we could certainly, you know, bring all our experiences and our knowledge together and just help everybody get more out of the cigars. I think education is the best thing. And that's why we do the tours. Uh, the tours that I do uh, cost money. I, I don't do them for free. And what I mean by that is, is that I don't do them to make money. Mm -hmm. I do them to cover the costs of the tour. Um, so the tour is very inexpensive and we offer a five day, four night tour for our American clients in the, this hemisphere and the European clients, we do eight day, seven night tours. And it's not just about Esteli and cigars. It's a total vacation. Uh, we see, I show culture. It's about, how many of you guys are familiar with um, uh, Anthony Bourdain and the show that he used to have? I like, I fancy myself the Ant Anthony Bourdain of the cigar business. <laughs> <laughs> because it's not just the tobacco. It's the culture in which the cigars are made in, the food, uh, the locations, the history, and then we, so we take you all over Nicaragua. We go to Granada, we go to Esteli, uh, we go to Leon, we go to the beach, Las Panitas, over on the Pacific coast, and we spend time at the beach. It's an entire vacation experience. We go to the Flor de Caña factory sometimes. Every tour is a little bit different, by the way. Since we only do 10 to 12 people tops, we kind of do it by, by vote, by democracy of, here's where we're gonna be. What would you guys like to do? Would you guys like to go to the bars, the clubs? the casinos, maybe horseback riding, maybe volcano surfing, maybe whitewater rafting, because there's somebody who wanted to do that last time, or do you want to just go to, the, we, we leave it open, or do you want to go to the roof and just smoke cigars and drink rum? So we have a lot, a lot of fun on our tours. Cigars are always there, like they are in your lives. However, you're doing other things when you're smoking them. You're, you're having different experiences. 
So we want to have a well-rounded, we want you to go away knowing more about Nicaragua and why the culture of cigars there is what it is and meet the people, eat in the places that they eat, go to the restaurants. I take people to the markets there with the meat hanging and the fruit all over the place, fresh vegetables, fresh everything. And people were like, man, I never thought I'd be here in a cigar tour. And well, yeah, that's the point. <laughs> this just isn't a cigar tour. This is an experience and a vacation. And we love that people walk away refreshed and enjoying. It. And I, there's a bunch of people here that have had that experience and a couple of them more than once, like like Thomas. Thomas has come back through my tour twice now. And Ian I'm had sure. a comment about Las Peñitas. Las Peñitas. Have you been there? Second, I, I, I had a, an extended vacation in Nicaragua this year, and I went to uh, Leon, stayed at the Hotel El Convento, which I thoroughly recommend to anybody. It's a fantastic place to smoke cigars. It's a fantastic city. And then just uh, 20 minutes down the road, Las Peñitas, you're on the ocean. Uh, there you go. It's um, very inexpensive accommodation, some nice restaurants, and a great place to smoke cigars and hang out. So I highly oh, recommend it. Don't just go to Esteli, go to Granada, go to La Panita. You'll really we do all of it on our tour. And uh, we actually stay at one of the beach houses that has become a boutique hotel on the ocean. And uh, some, of your, some of you guys have very fond memories. I see you smiling right now. Everybody, I see, I see a whole screen of faces. And I'm looking at specific faces that have been there and they got smiles ear to ear because they, they know exactly what I'm talking about. It's a lot of fun, a lot of fun. So, but again, it does cost, but uh, we do People it at- are interested, can they find the information on your website? Just log in and, and look it yes, up. Yes, we do have a tour page. Uh, however, we're updating our website and it's still there. It's not all accurate information because I've, I've morphed this tour uh, into what it is now. We used to do Nicaragua and Honduras on the same tour. Because Esteli and Don Lee Honduras is about three hours away from each other because there's a border in the middle. But I realized it was more beneficial to show more of a vacation atmosphere and see Leon and see the beach and go to the beach and then maybe go to a volcano and go to the, the, the rum factory uh, rather than see another factory, a cigar factory, another cigar factory, another cigar. After you've seen a few, and we show you a few in Nicaragua, you don't just see where Blanco is made, by the way. Well, Essencia makes cigars for a lot of people. And so you get to see all the cigars that are made at that factory. And then I have a mystery tour. We go to a cigar factory and it's different every trip in Esteli and it's another major manufacturer. You don't know until we pull up in front of their factory. We've been to AJ's factory. We've been to Oliva factory. Uh, I've done another few factories before that. And we also visit Granada. And when we go to Granada, I visit my friend over at... Uh, at his factory um, at uh, Mombacho. So we visited his facility as well. So again, you, you'll never find another cigar tour, if you want to call it a cigar tour, although I, it's more than that, that any manufacturer will ever take you to anybody else's factory. Nobody. Nobody's going to ever do that. I do it because it's not just about Blanco. It's about the, the culture of the cigar lifestyle. And how people do different different things, and the beauty of, that they all bring to the industry. So, I'm I looking at Macho Diplomatico, and uh, I, I'm just on the band now. But uh, there and, you go. Uh, I have Claudio. He's a great guy, and it's a fantastic factory. So, if you get to Granada, you must go to, to the Macho factory. Absolutely. Yeah. Claudio is a good good man. Good man. And and I'm I'm honored to call him friend. And Claudio is going to join us here at the Light'em Up Lounge within the next couple of weeks. We already got the session confirmed, and he will be here with us shortly. So Good deal. Good please deal. be on the lookout for that. Um, David, since you mentioned uh, a couple of other factories, and you also mentioned that you're doing blends for uh, a couple of different people, how hard is it for you to sort of adapt and, and, and to, to really get a feel for them, what they're looking for, and then come up with, with a blend for them, which is not yours and not part of your portfolio, but a separate project. Sure. So here's where the candid Dave comes out. And this is where you go. I can't believe he just said that. So the answer to that question is it's immensely difficult. These people are sometimes very hard to work with. <laughs> Why is that? A bunch of reasons. One is usually they're new to the industry. So they really have no idea what to do. They just, I want to, I want to make, I want to be in the cigar business. 
So they lean on me and my experience to try to guide them. So I become a consultant on top of their cigar manufacturer and blend, right? So that is the where the frustrating part can come in because they're it's like they're in a room in the dark trying to feel their way around and they're holding my hand. I can see everything in the room, but they can't. So they don't know what they don't know yet. They it's like going to your first year of medical school. You learn a little bit of medicine and now you're dangerous, right? So sometimes these guys can get a little dangerous because they, now they think they know something. And it's like, guys, listen, at, at the end of the day though, it's their company and their brand and they, they're going to go their own direction, whatever that direction is. So I have learned how to moderate my level of involvement based on the relationship that I have with certain that I make cigars for because I'm always there to try to help because their success is our success, right? So I want to impart as much information as I can to them, but sometimes it's not necessarily desired because they have a different way of how they think they want to market or advertise or how they want to distribute their product. So I have to learn and I've learned throughout the years and this takes, this is that experience level that comes in. I've learned how far to go with certain people with regard to what services I offer beyond manufacturing and blending. And some people are like, Dave, we want you to do, always tell us what you think. We always want to know your opinion because we trust you. You've been in this business for 20 years longer than I have or 18 years. Well, by no means do we know. I wish, I wish I had somebody like me with the level of experience and time and knowledge that was willing to share it with me when I first came into this business. Mm -hmm. I learned the hard way. I made a lot of mistakes. I then found some people that knew they were doing. I tried to learn as much as I could from them. And I still made a lot of mistakes. But working at Placencia, I had the advantage of seeing some of the other major, larger companies that they make for. I was able to have the behind the curtain view of the things they were doing and how they got to where they were. I saw the mistakes that they made. So they identified potholes for me and I avoided them. But I also saw the things that they did correctly that, that brought them to the success that they have. So I was able to identify some things without having to experience all the mistakes myself. And I tried to pass that on to people that I work with and say, hey, listen, there's a couple of ways you can do this. It's not just like Dave Blanco goes the right way and that's the whole way. There, here's your options. There's different op opportunities and you can do this. You, can do, you decide it's your business, but here are your options. Some guys, I don't even present those options because they just desire to figure it out for themselves. And that's fine too. So, And you would always work with them out of the very same factory and with the same sort of uh, stock of tobacco that you have available? Well, yeah, the stock of tobacco I have available is the Placentia stock. I have carte blanche to do whatever I want there and they have the most variety of tobaccos in the world at any one factory, hands down. I don't know of another factory. And I, I mean, any other, there's a lot of big factories out there, but I don't know of one, one factory that has a diversified portfolio of tobaccos that Placencia does. Mm -hmm. And I've been to a lot of large fat. I mean, I was, I was visiting my friend in the Dominican Republic just recently. And uh, I went to the largest factory in the world over there. You know where I'm talking about. And uh, you know what I saw when I walked in? I saw boxes and bales of Placencia tobacco. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> they were buying material. Everybody buys material, not everybody. A, a lot of people buy material from Placencia, you know, um, but because they're the largest growers, they're also the largest buyers because they have four factories and they make for so many people. So we have tobaccos from about 16 different countries. So when you come to the factory and you say, hey, what kind of wrapper would you like to use on your cigar? You know, a lot of factories will be like, well, we have three available, four, maybe five, if you're lucky. I have... 12 different wrappers at my disposal at, at my disposal at any time. So this is what brings these huge brands to Placencia, the tobacco. It's like being a painter. You're only as good as the amount of paint and the different colors that you have. They have all the colors available there. So when you talk about competitors, even competitors have product made in the same factory. You wouldn't think that they would pro probably do that, right? 
but they do because the diversification of material there is so large that they can afford, we, it doesn't matter. It's, it's irrelevant. I'll use some names, Rocky Patel and Alec Bradley. They both have their, not all of their production, but large amounts of their production are made in the same facilities with the same family using different tobaccos, but by the same company. Why is that? Because they realize that they can't get out of that, out of that factory, like out of somewhere else. It's, they would have to then purchase material, have it shipped over there. Placenti is a very vertically integrated company that can be a one-stop shop if you want. And I offer that to my customers as well. So you beyond the factory. You for choice with so oh, many man. that you it's have there. I literally go in there and I say, what am I going to do today? We got about 172 different varieties of tobacco. And those of you that have been to the factory, give me a thumbs up if you're, because you saw them all, right? There you go. A couple of guys, there you go. They saw, they saw it all. They, they saw a wall of tobacco and availability to do whatever you want. Let, let me phrase the question differently. Um, how do you make sure that you keep sort of a consistent profile and sort of house style within the company? Or would you say it's not as important to you? Because I realized, you know, you, you've got different approaches. Some people and some brands just have like a website with a hundred different lines on there. And you absolutely have no clue what you're going to end up with when you choose one of these lines. Right. And then some have, have a very clear, well-structured, narrow portfolio. And it's like, I know what I'm getting. What would mm -hmm. be your take on that? Well, I can tell you what my take is with regard to our portfolio. We try to have a cigar for every niche, mm -hmm. mild, medium, medium to full, three quarter body, full body. And then Within that range, I'll do different cigars with different wrappers. So they're completely different from each other. So um, I'll use the artist analogy. I, I do this from time to time. And this is one thing I tried not to do. Um, artists tend to have a style, right? Well, that's a Van Gogh or that's a, a Rembrandt. You know, they, you can tell their paintings, right? Because they have a certain style or it's a certain period and they use a certain type of color and some brush stroke. You can tell they have, it's a fingerprint for that artist. It is similar with blenders. Um, Don Pepin, a very well-renowned, world-renowned blender. I won't say everything he makes has a similarity because there are those anomalies that don't, but I can generally tell when I'm smoking a Don Pepin cigar because he has a certain style and it's a way, it's something that he likes that he enjoys, that he, the, the way he blends. And that's the same with other blenders as well. So what I tried to do was not fall into that trap. And the trap of being that guy where I know this is a Blanco cigar because he has a similarity in all of his blends. I didn't want a similarity. Mm -hmm. I wanted to have the variety to be able to go from A to Z completely different without that same consistent issue in all the blends. I thought I had accomplished that, but I, after I, I've done all these blends, I found out that I too have a fingerprint tell. And that tell is, is that I generally don't make any cigars unless it's really asked for by a, a person I make. Most, if not all of my cigars have a very clean finish. That's my tell, that's my fingerprint. I do not like tobaccos that hit you in the back of the throat and have a very long uh, finish. I, do, I don't personally like them. So I ended up realizing that I didn't use tobaccos that provided that. So I realized, crap, I, I, didn't, I couldn't avoid it either. It's just the way you like your cigars. And I, as the blender, can choose to do whatever. And so that's the one thing that I taste and aroma and things. I make cigars that I don't necessarily appreciate because I make them for a certain, not, my, not with my name on it. I, I can appreciate something out of everything that I make, but there are cigars that I've made for other people that I go, if that's what you want and you, I'll make it for you. I really don't appreciate it, but I'll make it for you. But even those, I found they have a clean finish. It's a very, very interesting point. You know, in the, in the wine industry, normally people, when they do tastings, they think of a long finish and, and a long aftertaste as a, quality um aspect right if that's what you like you know like you you get into the the fruitier crispy lighter wines not so much a finish it's the drier wines from 
in, in predominantly the reds that have the longer finish. Um, you know, so it's just a style. And so my style ended up being no long, humongous, harsh, back of the throat finishes. Mm -hmm. Just didn't like it. Ian was asking, do you have a specific tobacco that you're trying to avoid or you're probably not fond of? Uh, I'm not very fond of the, a lot of earthy tobaccos. Mm -hmm. And that isn't to say that I don't use them. It's that I use them more moderately because there's a place for that. It's just that too much of it can overwhelm a blend. And I don't like very earthy cigars. I say earthy, that's very politically correct. Cigars that taste like dirt. <laughs> you can be comical and say it that way. You know, it's it's very earthy taste. You know, you feel like you just lick, uh, you know, the dirt. And um, they're out there, but those tobaccos do have a place in blending. You have to combine them with other things to take sometimes the edge off the other tobacco. The earthiness will take sometimes a little bit of spice off, or it'll take off the leathery. Uh, you know, chewiness of the tobacco. So there is a place for them. I just don't like the dominant earthiness. In where, where would you say that earthiness usually comes from? Is it more a seed varietal thing or more the terroir in the soil? It's mostly the soil. It's mostly the soil. We have a question from Mario Langella. Please bring it up. Mario. Hi, David. How are you doing? I'm doing wonderful, my friend. Italiano? Yes. First where of all, are you at? I'm okay. Where, I'm where are you at? I live in, in UK. You remember, we met in London. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. My screen has got you very <laughs> small. I didn't see that was you. How are you doing, Mario? I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm this doing? big on my screen because there's so many faces. <laughs> <laughs> I hope we got, we got to see you soon in London as well. Huh? I hope so, brother. I miss it over there. I enjoy it. I was actually supposed to be in Europe. Uh, a, well, to, until today. Today, I was supposed to leave Europe. I was supposed to be there from the 2nd of this month to the 24th. All my events were canceled. Very disappointed. Well, hopefully, hopefully soon we're going to see you around. I hope so. Um, a question. I, I'm smoking the Blanco 9 Lancero. Oh, my a God. question is, I know that Lancero is always difficult to blend. Is the blend has born together with the rest of the line or something you decide later? And how difficult was to keep the, the flavors because it's very unique of the nine range? Yeah, so uh, it was secondary, um, Vitola. So I did all 52 ring gauges. I did a Robusto, Toro, Torpedo, and Double Corona when I did the nine line. And they were all 52 ring gauge, one, you know, five, six, seven, and six and a half Torpedo. Um, and I wanted something a little bit stronger, um, concentrated flavor. So I decided to do, the, and I'm a fan of smaller ring gauges. And since I did them all in 52, instead of doing a Corona, I did a Lancero and I fell in love. Once I fell in love with that, and the reason why I fell in love, because for those of you that may have drank Kool-Aid in your life, powdered, right? The amount of water you add to the powder starts to dilute the flavor and the strength of the flavor. The Lancero is one with a little bit of water because it's smaller ring gauge, less filler. The wrapper, in this case, the Escudo Corojo or the Dark Corojo, is very predominant in that it's a lot stronger than it is when you have more fillers. Even though they're three Lajeros, they're early priming. What it does is it brings down the level of strength and it balances the cigar more. That being said, I like a little more oomph in my cigar, but it also has a very clean finish, doesn't it? Yeah, exactly. It's actually, exactly. one of my again, there one of my favorite breakfast stick because it's uh, there's rich in flavors, but uh, perfect yeah. with the coffee. So it came as a secondary size. I did that as the first size outside the 52, and I did have to change it slightly. Now it's the same tobaccos. I just had to change the ratios a little bit in the filler. Obviously. So it is the same blend with the same tobaccos, but a little bit slightly different ratio in the colors. To answer your question, because I had to balance it out. Yeah. Well, thanks. Hope to see you soon around. Thanks, my friend. I look forward to see you too. Mario, many thanks for for your question and many thanks for being on the call. Always a pleasure. Um, 
David, I, I was wondering, and this is sort of going back full circle to where we actually started with your personal journey and, and your experiences in, in civil service. Um, what were some of the, the most important lessons and values that you got out of your previous experience in the civil service? And how did that change your approach towards the premium cigar industry? That is a deep question values okay um so i will tell you that in the military um in particular because that was what i joined at 18 they instill a certain set of values on the army values integrity um you know selfless service um you know honesty loyalty things of that nature um i don't have to tell my buddy over here mr smith about the army values do i yeah, he's in the army right now over in Germany. So uh, living the army values uh, provides you an opportunity to have some clarity in life. Uh, and it becomes a little bit more black and white, what is right and what is wrong. Um, I'm also a Mason. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a free Mason. Uh, masonry does exist, obviously, all over Europe. Uh, and in fact, I was at the 300th anniversary uh, in London a couple of years back uh, of the Grand Lodge in, in London, uh, which is where we all, the major house, which then came from the United States, the United States from there. That being said, we also have uh, like-minded um, ideas of uh, integrity, honesty, selfless service, um, compassion. Uh, we give back to society as a whole to help make others better the offer than they are. Um, I, I, I attack my business and my ethic and business similarly, which is why I help the people that I work with as much as I do. I offer everything that I can possibly offer to help them succeed uh, because I, I never want to be said that I've left anything uh, you know, on the table with regard to any reason that they might not have succeeded was because of failure that I did not share information that I know could have helped them. That also being said, I do business with my family because of the integrity and issues of the familial link, the loyalty to the family uh, business. Uh, and we are a family business. We are cousins, but my family Blanco was all three of us when we started and Placencia is our father or son as well. Um, and so that familial link means a lot to me. I can work with other factories if I desire, and I may work at other factories in the future, uh, in addition to what I do at Placencia. But it, they understand that it's not because it's a lack of loyalty to the family. And that's something that's very important in a family business. So um, uh, character uh, means a lot to us. Um, with regard to the tobacco that we grow and things that we use, I'm not going to cut corners with the material that I use, the process that I accomplish to bring about the product because it's got my name on it. And if you don't, if if you don't have the integrity in your name, you really don't care. But as I just mentioned, all those things are very important. So when I put my stamp on this thing, which is my name, it's my integrity, it's my family's name. So for us, we try to put the best quality product we can forward always using, and these are the three different words in, in our family's motto with regard to the business, is quality, tradition, and value. The quality of the tobacco that our family grows is second to none. The tradition of the hand-rolled cigar that our family's been making for generations in the style and classically long-filled uh, style that we don't cut corners doing those things either. And then value to the consumer. That's where my responsibility comes into you all because I am trying to give you the best possible product I can at the best possible price. I could charge more for the cigars that I make, but my model is volume. And so I'd rather have you guys be able to because it's more affordable, more often than, well, that's a cigar for a special occasion because you can't afford it all the time. So I try to have most of my cigars under 10 euros. You can't get a half a Cuban cigar for 10 euros. Well, maybe the small ones, right? 
And that being said, I would put my cigars up against any other cigar brand on the planet. Why? Because it's subjective, number one. So it really, it's apples and oranges. However, the four links in the chain that I always mention that you must have are second to none. We grow best tobacco. Our fermentation process is solid. The blending is my department and the proof is in the pudding. And the last is the construction. We have great rollers. We have rollers that have rolled best cigars of the year as, a, as seen by Cigar Fish and in the past. They've come out of our factory. So that being said, the integrity and what we present on, with our premium products, I put them up against anybody else. But usually at half the price. Awesome. It's great to hear and, and, and a wonderful statement that obviously means a lot to me and uh, I think to all the guys out there as well. Um, we, we heard the name Placencia quite a few times uh, tonight. I would love to give you all um, a little sneak preview of what's coming next on Light Em Up for the next week. And it's a super exciting week ahead. Um, on Tuesday, we're going to do a special feature with Alex Berezovsky, who was on the board for Pro Cigar. And now he brings a very fresh and, and unique take to the table with my cigar pack. He's doing a wonderful job. Very young guy, super enthusiastic. So it's going to be a different uh, story that he's going to tell us, but a very interesting one. And then on Wednesday, we have Nestor Anders Placencia joining us for an outstanding light em up session. I'm Friday. glad I came first. I'm glad I came first. You, you guys got a, a lead in a little bit. Then you know a little bit more about the talent. <laughs> but he better mention Blanco as much as I mentioned Placencia. I'm going to kick him in the butt. <laughs> <laughs> he won't. I know. <laughs> On Friday, then, we have another cracking session because, be believe it or not, um, Carlito Fuente is going to join us on Friday. Oh, he's about 20 minutes from me. Very nice. So maybe yeah, you can yeah. join us on Friday as well or jump over to his house and join us together. No, no. He's got to have equal time. I will leave him to his own. <laughs> well, he doesn't need me, that's for sure. It's going to be an amazing session. So I'm super, super happy to have uh, Nestor on Wednesday, Carlito on Friday. And then on Sunday, we have Sean Williams from Cohiba. So an interesting wow. week ahead. I'm very much. Another looking. interesting story. Uh, Sean Williams started in the industry with me. Oh, nice. He was one of those guys that came to me and said, hey, I'd like you to make a, a cigar brand for me. And that's how he got in. I said, if you're serious, buy a plane ticket. And he came down to Nicaragua and he came in with me at the factory and we started his brand. He started in, in this industry with a brand called El Primer Mundo. And I did all of his initial blends and everything else. Winding road for him as well. Now he's the brand ambassador for Cohiba. So kudos to him. Kudos it's to him for amazing that. to have this opportunity to share all these wonderful stories and, and wonderful people, amazing products with you all. And that's why we're doing the Light Em Up initiative. And it means the world to me. So I hope you all will tune in again next week and be our guest Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, Sunday. We've got an exciting schedule ahead. David, thank you so much for being on the show tonight. Before we wrap things off, one final question. If you were to sort of go back to that 18, 19 year old David Blanco, who was just about to start in civil service and give him an advice, what would that advice be to your younger self? Keep your head down and stay focused. And make your dreams come true. If you really want to do it, stay focused. Because life will throw a lot of curveballs and uh, pull you left and right. But stay online. If you really want to do something, make it happen, guys. You, you're the only one that can uh, keep yourself from accomplishing the goals and dreams that you have. I couldn't think of a better way to end this conversation. David Blanco, thank you so much for everything that you shared with us. It was a tremendous pleasure and honor for me to have you. Oh, honors, honors are mine, guys. Honors are all mine. And, and thank you all wait, for joining me. Can't wait to share and enjoy a cigar with you live super soon. So thank you for everything that you shared with us. All Thanks, the very guys. best to you and see you guys soon. Have a good night. Thank you, guys. Take care. Good seeing you all. I'll miss you. Mm -hmm.